Dr. Wright, as you know, we're producing a history archive for the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. And as part of that, we're interviewing uh, pioneers in the field, such as yourself, who were a part of the evolution of the field as well as the society. So thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Let's talk about your education. Uh, you started out at Stanford, and of course, your name is indelibly linked with that institution. Um, you did your undergraduate studies there, as I understand, graduating uh, in 1966, and you then went on to medical school at Yale University. That's correct. So you would have been a student when the first human heart transplant was performed in 1967. What do you remember about that period? Uh, that was an extremely exciting uh, period for people in medicine, in medical school, I think, especially someone interested in surgery, as I was. Um, it was such a, a huge event, uh, cover of Life and Time magazine and all of the uh, press reports at the time. It was uh, an amazing thing. It was in that era when uh, there were uh, things like the uh, Apollo mission and uh, the space program and it kind of had the same appeal to someone interested in surgery as those things did to the general public. So this sort of anything is possible kind of uh, That's right. It was uh, just an amazing thing. We were caught up in it. I was fascinated by it. And with my uh, experience at Stanford, I had been a physiology major and uh, had done some uh, research in physiology having to do with the heart. So I was naturally inclined to think about uh, heart surgery as a possibility. Uh, so it, it really piqued my interest a lot. So is this what, uh, so you, you then did an internship in surgery at Johns Hopkins, I understand. Actually, um, just to step back slightly, uh, <clears throat> because of being at Yale, uh, we had a requirement in our MD degree to do a thesis. And this had to be a ser semi-serious piece of work. It wasn't quite up to a PhD standard, but uh, and most uh, of the medical students took uh, six months, concentrated on their thesis study. And it occurred to me that uh, what I really wanted to do was, because of this interest in cardiac surgery and, and what was going on at Stanford, uh, I uh, contacted Dr. Shumway and uh, he agreed to let me come to the experimental lab as a student to work uh, in the lab on a heart transplant project in my senior year of medical school. Oh, what and a that wonderful was start. 1969. And, uh, who would I find in the lab that year but uh, Ed Stenson as uh, the fellow who was um, his only clinical responsibility was working with the heart transplant patients but his daytime job was uh, working in the lab. So having Ed uh, across the table doing canine uh, heart transplants really was the thing that cemented it for me. So your interest in not only surgery but cardiac surgery, but also transplantation, all evolved while you were still a medical student. That's right. And my thesis in uh, medical school at Yale had to do with the heart rate control of the denervated heart. Uh, <clears throat> but it allowed me to uh, go into the operating room and see some of these early heart transplants that were being done by uh, Dr. Stenson and Dr. Shumway. And then also to do some of the rounds on the patients uh, and these patients stayed in the hospital for three or four months at a time, so you really got to know them. Uh, and as a result of that six months, uh, Dr. Shumway usually liked you or he didn't like you. <laughs> and I was fortunate in that uh, he seemed to like me and he liked the, my enthusiasm, I guess, and, and dedication to what I was doing. So he said, why don't you come back and be a resident here? And of course, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And his ideas of surgical training were much different than the standard surgical training. So uh, as Dr. Stinson and uh, four or five other individuals, he suggested to uh, those people who he was uh, recruiting early into his program that they do a medical internship. So when I was at Hopkins, I was a Osler medical intern. He thought that the medical experience would give you a better background for taking care of patients, and I think he was probably thinking of transplant patients. So, uh, that's a very uh, forward-thinking way of um, considering training. That's right. Uh, Ed Stenson, for example, went to uh, 
uh, Minneapolis to uh, Hennepin County General Hospital to do a uh, medical internship, a very uh, busy medical internship where the medical interns have a lot more responsibility than surgery interns at that level. Mm -hmm. The same thing was true at Hopkins. So I did my medical training there and then the first year back at uh, Hopkins as a surgery resident was as a junior resident in cardiac. Uh, no general surgery path at all. So that was back at Stanford? Yeah. After you finished yeah. at Hopkins? Mm -hmm. After I finished one year at Hopkins, yeah. So you did a medical internship and then you went right back into cardiac surgery That's right. at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you've indicated already that um, Dr. Shumway had a major impact exactly. on your training. And yeah. I, I'm interested to hear mm -hmm. more about his philosophy of training. Well, he, uh, he was all about opportunity, giving people a chance to do something uh, and at an early stage and uh, go with it pretty much as you were capable. Uh, I think Ed Stinson was a perfect example. He had his medical internship. He did uh, the junior year of cardiac surgery. And then his third year out of medical school, he was the chief resident in cardiac surgery. And he was doing... Uh, just amazing, uh, complicated cardiac surgery, uh, including being involved in the first adult heart transplant in the United States that year. Mm -hmm. So if, if the person was capable, uh, if the resident could take the responsibility and, uh, and respond, he was uh, you know, all for promoting. And uh, he didn't like the idea of necessarily following a rote path through training tried to make it fit the individual. So he gave people a lot of opportunity in those early years. Eventually, within a few years, uh, the board decided it didn't like that pathway. It was too hard to define. Uh, Dr. Shumway recognized what he thought was quality, but uh, it was hard to describe to the board or have them accept that pathway. So eventually, this uh, style of training uh, stopped, and it went to a more conventional general surgery first, board certification and general surgery, and then cardiac surgery. But it was kind of a unique time of about eight to 10 years, late 60s, early 70s, where he had a different philosophy about training. Well, it's interesting because then you, you identify individual aspects, uh, and some people rise to that challenge probably mm -hmm. more easily than others. But having the talent to recognize those individuals. Yeah, I think Dr. Shumway was a great talent scout. And I think the, the fact that through all the years that uh, he was chairman, uh, so many terrific people came through and then went out to be heads of programs other places, I think um, showed that uh, his picks were pretty good for the most part. Well, uh, certainly the, the, uh, there's at least a generation of transplant-related and other mm -hmm. uh, non-transplant related cardiac surgeons who came through the Stanford program. Yes. And, I know that mm -hmm. uh, you've also had a keen interest yourself in resident training, and mm -hmm. I understand that's been an important part of your academic career. It sounds as if that mm -hmm. was built on perhaps the mentorship style of, of uh, Dr. Shumway as well. Yeah, I think so. Um, what I like and uh, what he showed was uh, having residents uh, at an early stage decide uh, to uh, pursue cardiothoracic as their tract, as, as their career. Uh, the previous paradigm of a, a six-year, five or six-year general surgery program was taking some of the best years of someone's life and putting them into something they would not ultimately be utilizing, they wouldn't be doing. Uh, there is some, of course, basic things that uh, would be helpful, but not five or six years of it. Mm -hmm. But if you can get someone going and thinking about thoracic and cardiac problems in their second and third year and thinking of themselves as cardiac surgeons at that time. Um, their commitment, their enthusiasm, their productivity is going to be much better. So we tried that program at Hopkins where we instituted picking someone out of medical school as a cardiothoracic track trainee and altering their program and fulfilling the board requirements but getting some of the flavor of the uh, the Shumway philosophy. It sort of helps them create an identity early on. Though, it does. It? And they also have the, the advantage of the people already in the program ahead of them that they bond with. There's a lot of uh, 
you know, education from your there? peers. Yes. You know, the residents just uh, a slot or two ahead of you are often some of the biggest influences, not just the faculty, but the other people that go through the system with you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you've created not only then uh, the pathway, but the next generation of teachers mm -hmm. as they're going through. I think that is part of it. Uh, you get, um, you know, that feeling of uh, you're learning from the people ahead of you and you're going to pass on to the people below you. And it's, it's a community of people. Uh, the typical program in cardiac surgery, if it's a two-year program after other training, will have uh, maybe four or six people as part of your community. But if you have a track where you have people from year one to year six or seven, then you have 14 people and you have a much better, more ferment of ideas. People are working on projects, people are doing lab work, and there's just more going on. So that's what makes a nice uh, environment at a place like Stanford. You just have a lot of people interested and they're going off in different directions mm -hmm. with the projects that they're doing. So the intellectual so. environment must be not only very exciting, but, but actually despite probably the, the grueling hours, it sounds as if there's a real intellectual nurturing uh, of, of, the, of uh, the trainees coming forward. It's an environment that, as Dr. Shumway used to say, is uh, friendly to learning. I think it's a term that came out of uh, University of Minnesota, but he always uh, described the Stanford environment as friendly to learning. Not that he was teaching anybody, but everyone was learning from each other. But he, create, he sort of created the environment for that That's to happen. That's right, and it was a collegial environment. It was friendly, it was uh, fun, it was something you look forward to going to work in the morning and being part of. So I think that explains a lot of the loyalty that uh, people that were in the program at that time, not just in the surgical side, but uh, cardiology, pathology, nursing, everybody uh, liked, you know, the kind of atmosphere Dr. Shumway set. And you see it even now. Mm -hmm. I mean, e even decades later. That's right. You still see that sense. You when still you... do, absolutely. Uh, the uh, the team meeting that uh, started almost from the beginning, I would say, in 1969 when I was the student there, and we had done 12 or 14 heart transplants, was still an occasion to get five or six people in the room together who were looking after the patient and talk about what was going on, what the problems were. And then through the years, uh, that kept going every week on Friday morning at 7 a.m. Uh, but now it's expanded to uh, about 50 people in that room. <laughs> so can you take us back then to December 1967, January 1968, and through those those well, early few years. I at mean, that time, I was uh, still in, I had not yet uh, hit the Stanford stage, so to speak. I was still at, at Yale in medical school, but I uh, was reading about not just Stanford, uh, but every place, uh, you know, South Africa, of course, and uh, what was going on in Houston. That was a, a big and very interesting uh, milieu with uh, Dr. Cooley and Dr. DeBakey and and their kind of rivalry. Yes. <laughs> There's a wonderful book by Tommy Tom Thompson, I think, or Thomas, I can't remember exactly, but it was called Hearts. And it's just fascinating reading for anyone interested in that era because it was a, a writer who spent the year at, in Houston and kind of went back and forth between the two programs and recorded what was going on that transplant year, the 1968 year when uh, it was exploding all over the world mm -hmm. with not always the best results as we know. Right, yes. And um, that became a celebrated feud over the years. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of looked at it from Palo Alto with uh, a little bit of humor because uh, nothing like that would happen there. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And, and so, so, but you were still a young trainee at the time. Yes. So, I mean, it's very interesting when something that fractious mm -hmm. emerges when you were still in the formative years of your training. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so you would have been going, you would have still been at Yale just getting ready to go mm -hmm. 
to Hopkins about then, I guess? Well, um, you know, we knew that was going on, and that was, that was just so anti Shumway. He was not about personality. He was not about the one guy who could do it. Uh, like, of course, Dr. Cooley is a, a master surgeon. Unbelievable contributions. But you went to Houston, and it was clear that uh, Dr. Cooley was the person, and no one else would, would uh, shine at all. Dr. Shumway, on the other hand, had these young guys uh, working hard and, and other people around him. But he was so generous in, su in supporting and pushing their development. And it was not about him. It was about everybody rising up and everybody shining and having a chance. Uh, along those lines, I remember reading an interesting quote. Um, as you say, Shumway was a very generous, uh, mm -hmm. spirited, it sounds to me that he was a very generous, spirited kind of mentor. And mm -hmm. I remember reading a quote about his description about Dick Lauer's particular surgical skills. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the impression was, well, it's not so important who does the first transplant. He may very well uh, mm -hmm. be ahead of me in doing that. I mean, the generosity of that comment I thought was so interesting, mm -hmm. particularly in light of what happened next. Yes. Well, in terms of that race to the first, uh, I think uh, in Dr. Shumway's mind and, and Dr. Lauer and others, it just seemed a natural outgrowth of what Dr. Shumway had done. It was kind of the next step. And uh, he had already publicly said after 10 years of work that he thought the time was right and uh, they were looking for a potential recipient. So when the um, news came from South Africa in December, it came out of nowhere. It came out of left field, as we say. <laughs> and uh, they just had no conception that this uh, would ever be done anywhere else. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Kantrowitz would. He had certainly had the work ahead of time to prepare for it. That's possible, and that would have been understandable. But uh, Dr. Bernard's uh, transplant came, and. And just because of who Dr. Shumway is, I, I know he was incredibly disappointed, but it, it lasted about a day or two, and then he moved on. He could, he could just uh, say, well, you know, that's okay. It just means that now we, some of the heat's been taken off. Uh, some of that fervor of publicity, certainly magnified by Dr. Bernard's personality, but it would have happened anyway. That was the sideshow could move off and we could just go on with what we were doing and try and make it uh, work as best as possible. So he showed great um, grace, I think. Yes, he just was that kind of person. You know, it certainly would be a, a day of disappointment, but uh, it wouldn't take him long to get over it and to just keep moving on. Because he was really building, not for yeah. an event, but for the for the Well, he, he knew, um, I think, probably intuitively that uh, it was only going to really succeed if it continued with kind of a programmatic uh, laboratory and clinical back and forth. And they had the milieu at Stanford. It was already going on for a long time. And he also just was so incredibly committed to it. He wasn't going to be um, discouraged by bad results early on, he was going to keep working at it. And he certainly did through, I would say, a good seven or eight years of uh, general discouragement in the world's medical community. But um, could, could we talk about that a little bit more, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, dark, the dark, dark days ages. of the early <laughs> 70s, I guess. Um, so for you in particular, mm -hmm. coming in as a, a junior trainee at that point, Having seen this tremendous team effort in really putting mm -hmm. solid building blocks in place, and then these disappointing years where mm -hmm. the, the first clinical results were so troublesome, how, how did that affect your own development as a, as a transplanter and as a surgeon? Well, it certainly uh, tested me a lot. Um, I was just exposed to incredibly dedicated people who were extremely good at what they did. And without that, I certain my career would not have taken the, the turns that it did. But uh, Ed Stinson and another person named Randy Greep. Randy Greep is not as well known in transplant circles because 
his career after he left Stanford and went to New York. Uh, and in the New York environment, it was hard to start a transplant program at the time. There was, it was more of a, a state uh, approval mechanism before a hospital could be allowed to do heart transplant. So he was kept from it during the, the years when uh, he might have continued his interest. So his direction went into aortic surgery. But uh, as a resident at Stanford, like Stenson, they were just not only extremely good surgeons, but they were the best medical doctors in the hospital. Ed Stenson became an infectious disease consultant, essentially. Uh, there weren't other people uh, involved in the care of the transplant patients. It was all the, the surgical team. So within the team came really good medical people to uh, take care of the patients. And as I said earlier, it uh, wasn't unusual for them to have a 60 to 90 day length of stay after transplant until things had settled down and they were ready to go out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was exposed to that sort of dedication that uh, at least twice a day rounds, the really thorough medical exam of the patient at every rounds uh, attention to all of the laboratory data. The diagnosis of rejection was measuring the height of the EKG in uh, four different leads and, and adding them up and following the EKG voltage. Well, let's look at that so. a minute. So if you were <laughs> making rounds then with the team and maybe one of the team members was actually measuring the, mm -hmm. the ECG and you were looking together at the condition of the patient and how it might have changed, then what would the next steps be if there was some decrease in the QRS voltage and a little worrisome change on mm -hmm. exam, what, what would you Well, uh, that would be uh, a 10 percent drop would be a real uh, leaning towards treating that with uh, solumedrol. And, and so would this be a bolus of uh, A bolus. Of, of it might even be a three-day three bolus mm -hmm. and then a taper. Uh, we just had, uh, of course, prednisone, azathioprine, and ATG, which was a homemade rabbit ATG that had been developed in the lab. Again, another project from a surgical resident who spent time in the lab. So this would have presumably been taking thymuses from congenital heart exactly. surgery yes. and injecting them into rabbits? Yes. Right? There was a, a little cottage industry in the lab uh, led by a, a, a Dr. Charles Bieber, who was a pathologist, researcher, working with uh, Phil Oyer, another uh, of the residents of that era who later became uh, so well known for his mechanical assist device development. But in the early days there, he was working on the ATG project. So, so. you uh, had the, this was the induction therapy, presumably, mm -hmm. or did you also use it to treat rejection? Well, particularly severe rejection, that was pulling out the big guns to use the ATG. And how often did you see what, what was severe rejection? And was it difficult to discern in those days? Well, it was. Uh, it was a lot of subtle signs, uh, of course, not only the EKG voltage, which could fall because of uh, uh, also with some edema. You know, a little fluid overload could yeah. uh, make the 10% change. But of course, that could represent a little heart failure, and that might be confirmatory. So you, it was all of these subtle things and how the patient was feeling and um, it was a real art <laughs> putting together these pieces of other information and uh, making sure that it's not also coming because there's a, a pneumonia developing somewhere in the left lower lobe and that's decreasing the voltage for that reason. You know, so the fever, the everything, it's just, uh, it was a very medically uh, important and the and the results at Stanford which improved from say 20 percent one year survival to 60 percent one year survival without cyclosporin uh, but came because of really good medical attention during that post-operative period dedication to it something that you wouldn't find in a primarily surgical environment as perhaps South Africa or Houston or and other places that were getting into it early on. Well, I can't imagine that it would have been completely routine for a surgical team to be mm -hmm. measuring ACGs right. and, and uh, mm -hmm. really looking at the detail, the fine yeah. details. But that was the Stanford environment. That was Dr. Shumway's, uh, you go do a medical internship, you get a feel for yeah. what 
you need to be looking at. So the complete physician. A little more of that, surgeon. yes. Yes, that was his idea about how the cardiothoracic surgeon should be, and that's how, although the training was not very standardized, it, it did have a, uh, an ultimate goal. So, so those early days then, um, as you said, the, the one-year mortality in mm -hmm. the early 70s um, was, was pretty bad, mm -hmm. uh, and probably the excellent uh, attention to care at Stanford m made it not quite so bad there. Mm -hmm. um, but was there ever any, any inclination to those of you taking care of these patients that this was a, a doomed therapy that really uh, maybe there was a thought uh, of not continuing? You know, I think there were some cases, and there's some ones that stand out in my mind. Someone that you became really attached to who two months after transplant on a Saturday afternoon developed a fever. And by m Sunday morning, and they were doing pretty well. They were really doing well. But by Sunday morning, they would be dead they'd have an E. coli pneumonia that just went wild over 12 hours and going into septic shock. And you would, uh, some, inevitably, you feel pretty discouraged about that. You know, are we really doing the right thing? Uh, you know, are we ready, ready for this? Uh, it was just a, and clearly, uh, if it were up to me at that point in time, I probably would have said, maybe we should stop doing this for a while. But. Thankfully, it wasn't up to me. Well, and nobody and, uh, knew that right around the corner. That's right. Was I mean, I'm just thinking. Well, that's gee, right. in, in you know, in 1974, or 75, mm -hmm. you know, it could, you could easily have become so discouraged because mm -hmm. it wasn't obvious that things were going to change really. That's quickly. right. Another thing that was just a a great example, I think, is uh, Philip Caves and Margaret Billingham. Well, that was my next yeah, question. So you've just, also uh, changed the diagnosis. That's uh, right. And then, then it became a little bit easier, and you could uh, differentiate rejection from infection a little bit easier. And uh, although you had the uh, EKG voltage to kind of indicate when you might do a biopsy, we didn't give up the uh, EKG voltage immediately. I know. When <laughs> I was training in transplant, 20 years later, <laughs> I was still taught the ECG uh -huh. voltage. So, so uh, the first few cases where mm -hmm. Philip Caves and Margaret Billingham worked together mm -hmm. uh, to develop the uh, endomyocardial mm -hmm. biopsy, can, can you tell us uh, how that started and which patients uh, were the first? Well, I was a junior resident the year Philip Caves was in the lab, so I was on the clinical side working many hours a week, and uh, Philip Caves was working many hours a week in the lab doing the heart transplants in dogs and then the uh, endomyocardial biopsies. Margaret was doing all of the analysis and coming up with the ideas about uh, mild rejection, moderate, severe, what happened when you gave the treatment. You know, She was always correlating what was happening clinically. She wanted to know every time she saw biopsies what is happening to the patient, what's happening to the dog. Um, and so she could, in her mind, also be correlating the structure and function. The uh, application to patients uh, was just uh, kind of a miraculous step forward, I think, in uh, being able to tailor therapy. So that was uh, just a huge thing. And that uh, happened in uh, August and September of 1972, I guess. So do you remember the first uh, Well, the not case? really. I, uh, uh, it was also the time of the Vietnam War, There's and uh, I had kind of uh, an obligation. <laughs> so in 1972, after a year in the junior residency, uh, I went to the NIH as part of the Public Health Service. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was flipping places, so to speak, with Ed Stenson, who had been there two years. Uh, 70 and 71. I went uh, 72 and 73. And with this public health service, we were fulfilling our military requirement and also had the great opportunity to work with the heart uh, branch at the NIH. Dr. Glenn Morrow was our mentor there. Mm -hmm. And he took five fellows per year into this program, and we were lucky to be in that. In other words, continuing to be productive in cardiac related work while still doing our military requirements. So I wasn't there when the, uh, Dr. Stenson and Caves were taking care of the first biopsy patients. But when you came back, it, it had to I came back, and then I got intimately involved with it. And 
and uh, was the chief resident in cardiac coming back and doing the heart transplants and on each and we would as the chief resident who did the operation we also were the ones who did the biopsies so I did hundreds of biopsies that year and every one of them we went to the uh, pathology room with Margaret and looked at the slides together and I would and the, the team with me would talk about what's happening to the patient. Margaret would tell us what's happening with the biopsy. And, uh, a real clinical pathology yeah. correlation, mm -hmm. which is really how it should yeah, be. And this pattern went on until, I think, around the cyclosporin years when the activity really increased. There were a lot more transplants. And the uh, biopsies at that time began to be done by the cardiologists and uh, certain of the cardiologists who did the uh, more invasive uh, uh, studies on the transplants, the uh, angiograms and so on, also then started to do the biopsies and we kind of lost that connection with Margaret. Mm -hmm. We were hearing about it, but we weren't actually sitting down with her and looking at it together. It makes a big difference, doesn't it? Does, it does, yeah. Yeah. So, so cyclosporin came along then mm -hmm. and changed everything. Yes. But before mm -hmm. the advent of cyclosporin, there was another momentous event mm. when you and your team did the first heart-lung transplant. So in yeah, 1981, I believe? That was uh, Dr. Shumway and Lauer. When they uh, did uh, the first heart transplants in dogs, also uh, had the idea that uh, if they took out the heart and the lungs together on block, then it could be a uh, pretty easy surgical operation to put them back in again. <laughs> so they did some uh, dog heart lung transplants and published one paper on it. I don't know the number, maybe six transplants. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Uh, that didn't work because the dog's breathing apparatus uh, under denervation is inadequate to support life. The whole pattern of uh, breathing in a canine model changes with denervation and they were uh, hypoventilating. So they might live for a day or two, but then they died. So it was always in the back of Dr. Shumway's mind that there's a, a role for heart and lung transplant because of the congenital abnormalities that uh, affected uh, pulmonary as well as cardiac development uh, or physiology, and uh, that there would be a role. And he was really interested in, in transplanting the block. So when I finished my residency and uh, wanted uh, to, as a junior faculty to have a laboratory project, he suggested in a hallway conversation, uh, why don't you go back and look at this heart-lung block again and see if you can make it work. And it was about like that. <laughs> so that started the whole uh, studies uh, devoted to heart and lung transplant. So that would have been in the late... It's uh, about 76. About 76. Mm -hmm. And so what finally uh, mm -hmm. led you to the first patient? The, uh, fairly soon we, we figured out the dog thing and that we needed to do a primate study. Mm -hmm. There had been some uh, indications from work that Aldo Castaneda had done in uh, primates that, uh, and he had shown auto-transplantation of a heart-lung block would in fact breathe normally. So, despite the denervation. Uh, despite the denervation. And he had used baboons, which are a, a much a larger animal model. We could not uh, in any way do that type of primate study. So we had some small monkeys available to uh, work in the lab, synomologous. They're about four to five kilograms. And it fit in with another interest of mine, which was pediatric cardiac surgery. And what a wonderful uh, surgical project to uh, operate on small primates, four to five kilograms, uh, learn how to cannulate, how to manage the pump, uh, how to operate in these uh, babies, so to speak. And uh, it was perfect. And, uh, and then we uh, moved our lab from a dog lab to a primate lab, Studi started the heart-lung transplant studies then. And uh, lo and behold, we could get survivors of auto-transplants the allo transplants would die of rejection after seven to ten days. We didn't even bother uh, to really treat them with the immunosuppression we had because uh, we were still early in the studies. And lo and behold, 
we heard about cyclosporin. We heard about uh, Roy Kahn's uh, work. Uh, David uh, White is a, uh, a research uh, pathologist at, in Cambridge, and uh, he uh, kind of recognized, I think, in the, for the first time when cyclosporin was used in a, uh, a rat model of heart transplant in Cambridge that this was something different and something very effective. So that uh, got the whole, there's a, it's a huge, wonderful story about cyclosporin, but he, uh, uh, I think it was mainly through uh, John Walwork, who was with us at the time, that David White came and gave a little seminar in a small room at Stanford uh, with about 10 of us there uh, about this new compound. It was very early and they were going to start using it in patients after renal transplant. So we were kind of alerted to this material and, and what was known about it at that time. And it sounded so fascinating. Uh, we really were interested in getting some cyclosporin to use in the lab. And through David and connections he had with uh, Sandoz, uh, we were able to get some of the uh, the compound, the powder at that time, and you had to mix it with olive oil and, and use it as an IM injection. Of course, no, <laughs> nothing IV. <laughs> so this was so, well before it was marketed. Yes, yes, it was. Uh, we probably first had it available late 87 or early 88, and it was the only Seven, U.S. 77, 78? 80, 77, 70, you're right. Yeah, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a decade, but uh, it was... Uh, I think the first lab in the U.S. that had uh, access to the uh, material, and uh, there were some uh, studies started in, in rat heart transplants, but uh, the main goal we had was to use it in the heart-lung monkeys. And that's the thing that really got us excited, got Dr. Shumway excited, because a lung transplant in any kind of laboratory model of survival was just dismal. There had not been any two-month survivors, let's say. And we had animals uh, after heart-lung transplant, IM injections of cyclosporin, uh, a little azathioprine, who were jumping around their cages and looking well, and, and the chest x-rays were normal. And Dr. Shumway, who didn't come to the lab very often uh, in those mid-70s, let's say, started coming every day to make rounds on the monkeys. <laughs> yeah. He was really excited about it. But it's a big step then to, to it is. Uh, go from these very, very promising mm -hmm. experimental animals and a promising new compound to the actual first clinical case. Yes, How did that and that, that had to really, uh, that, uh, that meant really that we had to, uh, the first approved use of it for patients was going to be in heart transplantation. So that worked its way through to uh, a clinical protocol, and the first heart transplant at Stanford to have cyclosporin treatment was in December of 1980. A uh, young man with a uh, cardiomyopathy who uh, turned out the donor was actually undersized pretty substantially. <laughs> and whereas uh, Shumway had never been a fan of heterotopic heart transplant, the disparity between the donor heart and the recipient heart was so great at the time, and Phil Oyer did the operation. Um, clearly, the only thing that we could think of to do was to do a heterotopic transplant. So, even though it had never been done at Stanford before, so the this first decision was made intraoperatively. Intraoperatively, yeah, just because when the donor heart came back in the bowl, it was so tiny. It was so small. So small, and to think of it as as replacing this patient's uh, heart and carrying the circulation. It was just, it was inconceivable. So the, the heterotopic heart was used and it, it was very effective uh, support and he did well. But it certainly added a new twist to biopsying the heart. <laughs> you know, we didn't have a lot of experience biopsying a heterotopic heart. And, and this is the first patient who, who got, got cyclosporin. Of course, the next patient who might have been a couple of weeks later was a more standard transplant. And there were perhaps three or four uh, heart transplant patients getting cyclosporin. 
And again, at that time, it was uh, IM injection, not uh, even oral. Not even oral. And did you notice an immediate? So, well, it, uh, it was clearly different, and it was clearly better, absolutely. Yeah, it was pretty obvious right from the beginning. So the day-to-day -day care of the patients mm -hmm. was, it was obvious that this was going to be something That's right. Help. We were seeing less infection and <clears throat> also uh, less rejection right from the beginning. And then uh, so four months later, and there were maybe five or six heart transplant recipients, we'd had some experience in measuring levels and, and managing patients, and then we... Uh, had to go ahead to do a heart lung recipient at that time. So who is the patient? Uh, Mary Golke. Uh -huh. She was uh, 45. She was from Arizona and had primary pulmonary hypertension, which we felt would be a pretty ideal recipient. And these were the days before any intravenous therapy for pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. It was such a malignant disease once it was established, and patients would go downhill very quickly severe right heart failure, uh, and she was desperate, and she was a very smart lady who uh, was looking for every chance to uh, survive, uh, and had uh, been told by a physician caring for her that there was no treatment, and the only thing that anybody could do to help her was if she could get a heart and lung transplant, if she could have new organs, she could so she had it in her mind mm -hmm. that a heart-lung transplant would help her, but of course it hadn't been done. No one had had any kind of success with it. There, it had been done. Three patients who all died within three weeks. These were back in the days when heart transplant was just, you know, 68, 69. Mm -hmm. um, so when she read a little uh, article in the paper about some work that we presented on the monkeys on heart-lung transplant monkeys that had survived. A little two-inch thing about uh, in Palo Alto, they have had uh, success with monkeys having heart-lung transplant, receiving this new drug. She contacted us, and we were just starting to, to look around our patient load and see you know, who might be a potential patient. So she was one of maybe five or ten we were considering. But uh, she rapidly rose to the top because of her determination, right. her, her uh, willingness, willingness. For yeah. She always said from the first couple of visits that she didn't want to be the first. She'd rather be the third or the fourth, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but then it uh, it was pretty clear she couldn't wait. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so she um, underwent transplantation, mm -hmm. and was Since, it uh, March um, of 1981? And was it long before you? you realized that it w would be a success? I mean, you were building on a few Yes, uh, it was. Uh, of course, uh, we had our ups and downs, and it was not immediately obvious that we were even going to get out of the, uh, out of the first month because uh, although the, the graft worked well, uh, fluid management was a big problem. Uh, we had to, she was pretty debilitated, and nutrition was a problem. So with her kind of inability in the first couple of weeks to eat, uh, we were using hyperalimentation to uh, feed her IV. So uh, we uh, gave her too much fluid and she uh, developed uh, pulmonary edema, had to be reintubated. This is about two weeks post-op. Uh, and of course, at that point, was this lung rejection? Uh, was this our uh, to overly aggressive fluid management? Uh, we were just totally flying by the seat of our pants because we had taken care of monkeys, but we had no idea what, uh, you know, just a general idea, but about lung transplant behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also had the mistaken notion because of uh, just some anecdotal experience in the animals that if we did cardiac biopsies, we'd be able to detect rejection in the graft, including the lung graft. We thought they would be synchronous. Turns out, of course, that lung and heart rejection can, is usually asynchronous, right. but we didn't know that. And uh, uh, we biopsied her and thought we saw changes of early 
rejection and we treated her for rejection but I think really the therapeutic thing at that point was uh, diuresis and uh, better fluid management and after two or three days she was extubated and then she was on a trajectory that uh, led to uh, her being well you know so she uh, was discharged in good condition and uh, she actually ultimately lived for five years that's a tremendous yeah. success so out of the blocks to do your first patient with a lung transplant and have them do well uh, I think that really, at least uh, in the transplant community, the, uh, to have a lung transplant do well was kind of uh, an extra seal of approval on cyclosporin. I mean, if it, okay, it, it would seem like it was going to help heart transplants go up another 10 or 20 percent one year survival, 10 or 15 percent. But to have it take something that had been impossible before and make it possible, then it must really be good. That's a real quantum it leap, was a, isn't it? Yeah. So it, it had a little booster effect, I think, on cyclosporin. We were also very fortunate. The second patient did well uh, and left the hospital and was another poster child for lung transplant and for cyclosporin. So um, I think that uh, helped... Uh, jumpstart the enthusiasm and certainly gave lung patients another option. Right, yes. And that's a, another story in itself. <laughs> well, just the possibilities, opening the door to the possibilities mm -hmm. went from complete f failure of all attempts to the fact that success can be achieved mm -hmm. really gives a great sense of encouragement to the whole community, doesn't it? Yes. Well, that's a wonderful story um, and mm -hmm. I, uh, I really appreciate you spending some time mm -hmm telling us about it and uh, about your years in oh, this field. Uh, obviously, you've, uh, you've made an enormous contribution well, to the field. I think that, uh, like Dr. Shumway, I'd be the first to say it was the people around me that contributed to everything. I mean, it's just trying to make an environment where everybody... Dr. Shumway used to say that every resident he had somehow contributed to the method. There was always some new thing that happened every year uh, it could be a surgical thing, it could be a medical thing, something that how we took care of the patients. There was always some improvement year by year, and it was always uh, everyone else, you know. And, and that's the way I feel about it, because uh, his philosophy many times said was that he tried to get people smarter than him rather than in a lot of other environments. Uh, people hate that competition or something, and... and don't know, don't seek that, but that was, that was his philosophy, and I've been very fortunate, both at Stanford and at Hopkins, where I was for 10 years, to have really smart people around me. Well, so. it's a legacy. It sounds as if you not only benefited from yourself, mm -hmm. but have gone a long way to pass on to the next generation. Thanks. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. Thank you very much. Thank you.